Well, good evening, folks. It's lovely to see you all. Uh, if you want to take a chair and move somewhere else, that's not how our chairs all move in this place, so don't worry. Uh, you're, very, you're very glad to see you all this evening. Um, friends from Knockbracken, and uh, some friends from Trinity, and some friends from our field as Limerick as well. You're all very welcome tonight. And we invite you to stay with us afterwards for a bit of supper too. Uh, trust that you know God's blessing in that as we share our time together. Um, so our practice that we have a time of prayer after our service is over, just after I pronounced the benediction. I thought that would be a lovely thing for us just to share together in prayer at the end of our service. Just a very brief time. And uh, we'll not be sharing points for prayer. You know the things we ought to pray for for one another. So if some can lead us in prayer just after I pronounce the benediction, I'll guide you uh, at that stage. And we can, we can pray for one another in our, in our different congregations. Well, we're here to worship the Lord, and our opening psalm of praise is Psalm 45. We're seeing these six large verses. My heart it overflows, a noble theme I sing, my tongue's a ready writer's pen, reciting to the King. The psalmist is filled with uh, sheer delight in his opportunity to praise God. He thinks of the great Lord and Saviour, the one who's victorious, the one who's going out and Uh, defeating all his and our enemies. It says at the end of this psalm, Your endless throne, O God, forever will endure. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter right and pure. We stand together as we sing these verses and remain standing for prayer. My heart is over. Come before you to bring our praise in that one way that you've opened up in the life and death and resurrection of your Son made flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to bless you for him, the one whom we've been singing of, the one whose throne is endless, the one who has all dominion and all authority, granted unto him as the God-man for all that he accomplished in the cross. We come to bless you for him who victorious rides in state this day throughout his his world, building his church. We come to rejoice that he has uh, put on his thigh his sword and gone out with that sword of the Spirit, conquering his enemies and making them willing in the day to believe on Jesus Christ. We thank you for this 
weekly reminder at the beginning of each week of our risen Saviour, Jesus Christ, the one who's lived and died and risen, ascended into heaven, and will come at the last day to judge the living and the dead. And so, Lord, we come to bring you our worship. We come confessing our many sins, Lord, as we think back in the year that quickly now comes to a close. We confess, Lord, that we fell far short of being the people you've called us to be. We've left undone things that we should have seen to. We have done things that we ought not. We thank you that in Jesus Christ there is pardon for all who believe, no condemnation. We pray that his glorious gospel would stir us up to live for him increasingly in the year that lies ahead. Thank you for all who've gathered here this evening. Thank you for opportunity to unite together as the people of God, to sing your praise and to hear your word. Bless us, Lord God. Come amongst us as you've promised and fill our hearts with fear and and wonder at all, at all that you are and all that you've done. And stir us, comfort us and exhort us. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. <coughs> I invite you to turn in your Bible with me to the book of Revelation. And we're going to read together this uh, opening chapter. Let's hear the word of God then in Revelation chapter 1 from verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I join your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. And as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. 
Well, we turn to the words of Psalm 126 to unite our voices again in praise to God. This psalm it reminds us of the rule of our Lord, of his presence with his people, of the strength and the grace that he gives to all of his own. Those in the Lord who place their trust are just like Zion Hill, for it cannot be moved at all, but stand forever well. Psalm 126, we sing God's praise once more. The Lord brought of us here this evening and know exactly what each one of us needs in our lives tonight and so we ask you mighty God for the working of your spirit that he would take the words on the page of our Bible that he would take the words of the preacher and press them into the little nooks and crannies of all of our hearts will you lift us up and encourage us mighty God tonight as we venture out into a new year Will you give us eyes for your Son, Jesus Christ, that we might rejoice in him and step out boldly and in confidence, knowing that he is our Lord and Saviour. Hear our prayer, Father, for we ask it in the name of your Son and for his sake. Amen. Well, please open up your Bible this evening in the book of Revelation. We're coming to look this evening in Revelation chapter 1, not all of this chapter, but engage your thoughts this evening towards the verses that are marked from verse 9 to the end. If you like a little heading to hang your thoughts on for a sermon to help you listen, just picking out a few words from this portion where John says in verse 17, I saw him, I saw him. And I trust that'll be your experience this evening, that you'll see him. You see, reformed worship is not intended to be some dry thing that we just go through the motions. It is those who know and love the reformed faith that most of all 
ought to have a glorious experience of God through his word and by his spirit. So may that be the case this evening. We've prayed for it before we, we came and as we gather that we would see him. Well, I think it was Spurgeon. You'll have heard preachers use this illustration. I think it was him who used it first of all. Uh, he said on a, on a day he went out and he saw a man ploughing a field with a team of horses. And he asked the ploughman how he managed to, to plough such a straight furrow in the earth. He was amazed at it. Here was this line of furrows just so perfectly straight. And the ploughman answered or gave his, his secret. He said, I set a marker in the hedge and I keep that marker between the team of horses in front of me right in the middle. And as long as I have my eye on the marker in the hedge in the distance, all will be well and I plough a straight furrow. Well, this evening, we're going to set a marker in the hedgerow of our lives. Someone that you and I are to keep our eyes riveted upon. For if you're a follower of Jesus Christ this evening, you'll have one desire. That in the year ahead you want to plough metaphorically a straight furrow in following on after the Lord Jesus Christ. And the marker in our vision is the one and only Lord Jesus Christ. This marvellous book of Revelation was, was given initially to some Christians for whom ploughing their furrow was difficult and challenging. It was full of stress. It was full of the unexpected. And there was much to cause them to waver and have a wobble in their path. These Christians were about to face a rising wave of persecution under the Caesar. Believers were being called to confess Caesar is Lord. And that persecution was causing many of them to knock at the knees. And around AD 96, God gave the elderly John a vision and a letter to set out a picture of Jesus Christ that these men and women would set up in the hedgerow of their lives. Well, can I ask you this evening, are you in need of a marker in the hedgerow of your life? I think it will be the one thing that unites us all, whatever our background, our age, our experience. There's much that would make us wobble. Perhaps you've got the pressures of work to look forward to in the next few days. Perhaps you have the winds of change blow in your life, in your own personal life, in matters of health or struggles in your family. But we look out at the state of the church and there's much that grieves our hearts. Numeric decline, spiritual decline and great weakness. Or you think of the state of the nation and all its godliness. Do you not need a marker in the hedgerow to set your eye on? Well, here it is in this portion of Scripture this evening. The Lord gave John this vision when he was in the island of Patmos. You'll see in verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Isn't that interesting that it was on the Lord's day that the Lord had a special blessing for this troubled elderly saint. It was on the Lord's day that the Lord had a message to give to his servant for the church of Jesus Christ through the ages. Haven't you found that to be the experience of your life? That it's on the Lord's day that you meet with him and he sets again this marker in the hedgerow of our lives. So let's spend a little time this evening noting three things about our great and glorious Lord Jesus Christ from this passage. Three simple truths to remind you of, of this evening. You know them and they're here in this passage to help and to bless you this evening. First of all, we're reminded here that Jesus Christ is concerned for his church. I'm sure all of you this evening are concerned for your church. There'll be matters in your church that you think about often and pray about often. You're concerned. Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the churches in his day, wrote about the concerns of the church that weighed heavily upon him. 
Well, Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd of the church, has con is concerned for his church. You notice how this section begins at verse 9. The apostle John, an elderly believer, now puts himself right beside all of the, the believers of the church at that time and indeed through the ages. I, John, your brother, and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. This elderly servant was facing what for him was a very difficult and strange thing, but yet, in another way, it was an ordinary Christian life. He was in tribulation. He was in difficulty and stress. He was serving the kingdom of God and was enduring by the grace of God. God and his Saviour, Jesus Christ. Is that your life? Sure, you come this evening with tribulation and difficulties, and yet as a follower of Jesus Christ, you're in his kingdom, and you'll endure in this year with patient endurance because of this great Saviour, Jesus Christ. John, this elderly believer, finds himself imprisoned in Patmos. It was a penal colony. Uh, you'll find it on a map in the Aegean Sea just off the coast of Turkey. Ten miles by six miles. And what a sad scenario. This beloved servant of God has been banished. Placed in exile. The authorities of that day couldn't handle the message of the gospel that he proclaimed. And this servant of God was in trouble. He was lonely. And his course was hampered. He wasn't able to do the things that he did in days past. Maybe that will be your experience in the year that lies ahead. Unable to do the things that you would love to do and did in days before. This message will have encouragement for you. You see, the elderly John had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. He was tra transported into a state of prophetic inspiration, you'll see in verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me in a loud voice, like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. What a moment that must have been for John. That voice of his master that he'd heard 60 years previously. And he hears them again. Tenderness of the Lord Jesus Christ for his people. And the tenderness of Christ for his church. Do you do know that this evening? He knows all who are his own. You one of his sheep this evening? You one of his little lambs this evening? He knows all who are his own. And he delights, as he did with John, to come to his own. He delights to come to pour light into the darkest moments of our lives. He delights to come and transform our mourning into dancing. So if you're his this evening, perhaps you have your own island of Patmos. Is that you? Circumstances that you wish were different? And here in this passage, Jesus Christ is reminding us how he loves to bring comfort and his concern for his church. You see, the emperor had banished John, but he couldn't banish the love and the concern of Jesus Christ. It was a message for John, and not just for John, but we're told in verse 10 it was for the seven churches. And then they're listed. There were seven literal congregations at that time. Seven, several real congregations, as real as this one, as real as Limerick, as real as Nook Bracken, as real as Trinity. Seven beloved groups of the people of God. These seven churches are also added to being literal churches, they were a picture of the church of Christ over all the years and over all the nations. Not that the church, as some mistakenly think, that sometimes the church is in the state of the church of Ephesus, Pergamum, and Theratire, etc. You'll find this throughout all the churches, throughout all the ages. And here he's showing concern for his church throughout the ages. Has Jesus Christ changed any? Not according to the scriptures. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. And he's deeply concerned for his church and about his church. Your little group in Limerick, 
He's concerned for you there every week when you meet. He knows all of your needs. You folks are not bracket up on the hill. He's concerned for you. Whatever it is that might be troubles in the, in the future, he's concerned for you. And from Trinity, with your need of a pastor, he's concerned for his church. He knows everything that's going on. And what we need is what John experienced an encounter with the great and glorious Jesus Christ. And that's the reality for Christ's church today. Not that we have this prophetic transformation that the Apostle John had. But you notice in verse 11, uh, or rather, yeah, in verse 11, uh, the voice of the Lord says, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. Write this down, John, that my churches throughout the ages will have this message about me and set it up in the hedgerow of their lives. You see, when the church gathers week after week, we ought to have a similar experience to John, <coughs> meeting with our glorious Saviour, Jesus Christ. That's exactly what the church needs it's exactly the experience of life that you need week by week to meet with this Saviour concerned for his people. And just as he came on the Sabbath day when John was on the island of Patmos, so the Lord Jesus comes week by week to meet with his church and to express his concern for her. So if you come this evening and you're concerned about the church of Jesus Christ, know this, that Jesus Christ, he thinks about her, he cares for her, and he's deeply concerned, not in a panicking way, but in his love and in his mercy, thinks of all of his own. And if the spirit of Jesus Christ is in you this evening, you will have something of his heart for the church of Jesus Christ wherever she is. Here in the city, on the outskirts of the city, and to the ends of the earth. Because Jesus Christ is concerned for his church. But secondly, in our passage this evening, we're reminded wonderfully that Jesus Christ is with his church. He's with his church. It's difficult being on your own when things are tough, isn't it? A young person can experience that at school or university or going to their workplace for the very first time. I'm, I'm on my own. <coughs> we always appreciate the presence of someone who loves us, their words, their embrace. Well, Christ has all of those things for his people and for his church. He's with his church. Look at what this vision that John has given in verse 12. <coughs> We're told there in verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. We're told in verse 20 what these seven lampstands picture. If you look down at the very end, the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Those literal seven churches mentioned back in verse 11 and the church of Christ through the age. Here's this wonderful picture. I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. It was Jesus Christ forever assuring his church that no matter what the circumstances, no matter where they were, no matter what was happening, he would be with them. He would be right there in their midst. You remember that this evening when you were coming, didn't you? And going to where Jesus Christ will be in the midst of his people. Every week, he's there in Knockbracken. 
here in Woodstock, in Limerick, and in Trimley. Isn't that why wild horses wouldn't keep you away? Because the Christian says, I want to be where I can experience Jesus Christ in no other way on this earth than in the midst of his people. Someone once cleverly wrote, if you can miss church without you cause, there's something missing. You see, the believer knows that Christ is in the company of his people. And John has given a little glimpse of this Christ. Look at him. Look at him on the page of your Bible and be blown away by his glory. I'm going to look at these verses uh, following here, verse 13. The details of this picture are important but it is the combined picture that is the key. We're to be overawed by the complete picture. We're to feel the weightiness of the glory of the one who's in our midst. So John has given this picture of Jesus Christ. It's not a literal picture that he's painting. You'll notice the word like appears uh, over and over in this. One like. It's more of a, the work of an impressionist artist. I don't know much about art. I find the impressionist most difficult of all to begin to understand. But the colour picked, the weight of the stroke, the angle of the stroke, all combine to make a masterpiece of meaning. And it's the same with these verses 13 and following. The palettes that the writer is using is the whole of the Old Testament scripture. He takes his knife or his brush and picks up little daubs, if you like, of little snippets of the glory of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament and adds them to this glorious picture so that we might see who's with us. We're told in verse 13, in the midst of the lampstands was one like a son of man. You know that that was the favourite self-declaration of the Lord Jesus when he walked on this earth. The Son of Man. We initially think that it's is a reference to his humanity. And while it does hint at that, it is much more than that. It is a reference primarily to his divinity. You see, the, the writer here has, has picked up this glorious colour from, from Daniel chapter 7. The one who approached the ancient of days, one like a son of man. It's the one who's been given all authority and all power and, and, and might and his kingdom that will reign forever. And John's told that this, who's with, who's with the church of Jesus Christ through the ages, the one who has all authority. That's who be with you, Christian in the year that lies ahead, the one who has all authority, the one who rules and reigns, the sovereign God. We're told in the words that follow in verse 13 that he was clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash round his chest. Well, he's spelled fast, an interesting place to mention a sash in. It's got nothing to do with that. Picture here, and although it doesn't initially strike us, in the Bible, uh, in, the, in the land of Palestine at that time, uh, uh, long clothing was, was the sign of a high-ranking dignitary. It was a sign of highest office, and the, the longer your robe, the higher your office. And that's what's picked up in this picture. One who's clothed with a long robe. The one who has ultimate authority. The one who has the highest office. The idea of the golden sash is uh, it's most likely taken from Daniel chapter 10, the one that Daniel met and was told that he was greatly loved, the one who was in charge of everything. This, who's with his church. He's the one who's in charge of everything. 
does not comfort you, Christian, that whatever the year ahead might hold, does not comfort in our, in our churches, in our congregations, that the one of the highest office, the one to whom the Father has given all authority in heaven and earth, is with us. We're told in verse 14 that the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. Again, it's Daniel chapter 7. That one who came before the Ancient of Days, the one who had all the attributes of God. Is there anything that you could possibly need in your congregation that this one who is with us could not give us? We're told that his eyes were as flames of fire. The picture here is one who misses nothing. The one who can expose every little detail in a situation. That's who's with his church. The one who sees every enemy. The one who's ready to deal with every enemy of the cause of Christ. We're told in verse 15, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. It's a military image. It's one of might and power and glory. There's nothing that can defeat him. And we're told that his voice was like the roar of many waters. During the summer and holidays, we went to visit a, a gorge, steep, narrow gorge. You could reach out and touch the sides of the wall. And underneath our feet, as we walked in a little walkway, this, these plunging, roaring waters. You couldn't have a conversation with the person beside you. In a way, it was a frightening place if you hadn't all the safety features around you. And that's what John is this picture of Jesus Christ, his voice like the roar of many waters. Every enemy of this great king who's with his church will tremble before him. We're told that his mouth has a sharp two-edged sword in verse 16. Here's the picture of the invincible warrior. And when he says, fear not, well, that'll be the most simple thing and the right thing that we'll do. His face is like the sun, we're told, shining in full strength. It's taken from Judges chapter 5. Again, a warrior figure. Glory beyond what the eye can endure. That's who's with your congregation in the year that lies ahead. That's the marker in the hedge, Christian, for your life. Jesus Christ is with his church. When our eldest boy played many rugby at primary school, they were utterly rubbish. But they had one secret weapon, William. William was head and shoulders above everybody else. And the coach, I remember rightly, the headmaster played for Ulster uh, just not, short, not uh, too long before he came to the school. He knew a thing or two. Well, he got one tactic. And you could hear him shout it every match. Get the ball to William. Christian, get all of your troubles. Get all of your sorrows. Get all of your fears to your great King and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He has all the resources that you need. What a glorious thing the Church of Jesus Christ is. Because Jesus Christ is in her midst. On our work here in East Belfast, we're often out in the street on a Friday we meet some who would claim to be Christians. I ask the next logical question, well, where do you belong? And the answer, sadly, so many times, well, I don't belong anywhere. I got disillusioned with the church. Well, the church has all of our difficulties, yes. We admit that. 
But no follower of Jesus Christ ought to be disillusioned with the bride of Jesus Christ. Because his heart is filled with love for her. He's concerned for her. And he's with her. And you and I, in the year ahead, as you belong to Christ's church, get the great privilege of worshipping in her, in her midst, and serving in her midst. What a blessing. Thirdly and finally in our passage, not only to see Christ's concern for his church and with his church, but Christ comforts his church. How vulnerable John must have felt, an elderly man, spent physically, not able to do the things that he once did for God. Maybe you have a sense of your vulnerability. In our church here in Woodstock, we certainly have a sense of our vulnerability. There are not very many of us. And we're not very gifted. Many Christians have a sense of their inability about their witness. How will we ever witness for Jesus Christ? And we need comfort. And that's what Christ brings his church here. In verse 16, in case you think I missed this little part, we're told in his right hand he held seven stars. Imagine someone great enough to pluck, as it were, seven stars from the sky and to play with them in his hand. We're told here that Jesus Christ holds in his hand seven stars. John was probably, maybe possibly is a better word, possibly alluding to a little coin that was on the go in Roman times. One of the emperors, for his own glory, uh, had one of his children depicted on the coin playing with the stars. It's possible where this picture comes from, it would tie in certainly. And here is this great message from God. It's not any man who's overruling and has everything in hand. It's the living Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we're told in verse seven what the seven sorry, verse twenty, what the seven stars are. At the end of verse twenty, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Well, although we're told what the seven stars are. It doesn't necessarily immediately help us because the next question is then, well, what are the angels of the seven churches? And commentators differ. Some would say they're the guardian angels of the churches. Some would say it's a reference to the, the spirit who prevails amongst the churches. Some would say it's the messengers that serve in the church, bring the word. Well, whatever the right interpretation you can choose for yourself, the message is just the same. That the church of Jesus Christ is in his safe hands. That's what we're told. In his right hand, he held the seven stars. And if those seven churches we're not only literal churches, but we're a picture of the church throughout all the ages. That includes every congregation that's represented here this evening. In his mighty, powerful, sovereign right hand. That's why we plough a straight furrow. Because his hand is on his people every single day. And the elderly John has the right response, doesn't I? Verse 17, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He beheld the glory of Christ. And like Isaiah, in the Old Testament, he felt undone like Manoah, who thought he was doomed for having seen the Lord. He falls down in worship. And that ought to be your response and my response every Lord's day when we worship. Not literally, but in our hearts, falling before him 
Sabbath by Sabbath. This is our God. This is our Saviour, Jesus Christ. He's concerned for us. He's with us. And he comforts us. And how gentle he is. Well, look what happens in verse 17. He laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. The way it's written, it was a call to John to not be afraid, for he knew he was afraid. Stop being afraid, John. You can <coughs> trust me. And look what he tells him. Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am the Lord of all history. He says, I died and behold I'm alive forevermore. I've defeated death. And I have the keys of death and Hades. I rule over all. Those words that some of you need to hear again this evening. Fear not. I am the first and the last. I'm in charge. And I'm full of might and power and tender love for all who are my own. So whatever 2024 will hold, if you're a follower of Christ tonight, all will be well. So set up this marker in your hedgerow of your life. Maybe some of you are here this evening and you know all about this glorious person, Jesus Christ. And the thing that you should reflect on this evening is simply this. Why have I not begun to follow one so glorious? And he calls you, turn from your sin and begin following him. Set up this marker in your hedge, Christian, and keep your eyes on him. And Sabbath by Sabbath, I trust it will be your experience as you meet for worship that you'll say, I saw him and that was all I needed. Amen. Well, we sing praise to God from Psalm 46. We sing the opening Lord's verse and then 6 to 10. Verse 1 and 6 to 10. God is our refuge and our strength. Let's praise him. God is our refuge and our strength.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.